Hello, everyone. My name is Leandro Félix. I'm a lawyer at Machado Merida Advogados in Brazil, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's event, which was designed to address some of the key issues in international arbitration in view of the litigation culture in Brazil. Before we start on a personal note, I can deny that I'm very honored to be here today. I would like to thank my dear friends, Monica Murayama and Lucas Passos for the kind invitation. Thank you very much. This is um, this event is part of the first Georgetown Brazilian Arbitration Day. The event is organized jointly by the George, Georgetown Brazilian Law Association, the Georgetown International Arbitration Society, and Arbitration Channel, which is uh, kindly broadcasting this event online on its YouTube channel. Uh, this is the second of a series of four events taking place today. The topic of our discussion is the Brazilian litigation culture, impressions from international arbitrators. And we were able to put together a team of four distinguished international arbitrators who I will start introducing now. The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Professor Marcelo Huck, who I'm sure is well known by all of you. He's a founding partner of Huck Otranto Camargo, a firm based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's a professor of international law at the University of Sao Paulo and has served as an arbitrator in hundreds of proceedings. Our second speaker is Maria Claudia Prokopiak. She's an international arbitrator, former deputy counsel of the ICC and the founder of Prokopiak Arbitration, a London-based firm. Uh, we also have here Mauricio Gonsantos. He is a dual qualified lawyer, both in Brazil and New York, and a foreign legal consult consultant in the state of Florida, where he is the founding partner of GST LLP in Miami. Finally, our fourth panelist is Professor José Gabriel Assis de Almeida. He is a lawyer in Rio de Janeiro, specialist in international arbitration, and serves as a professor at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. On behalf of the organization, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. We are looking forward to hearing from you. Finally, before we pass to the Q&A, uh, I would like to invite the members of the audience to send their questions. Please don't be shy. We promise we will try to address as many of your questions as possible during the debates. So. With, with the introduction being made, it's I guess it's time to kick the ball. <clears throat> uh, this event will have four parts, and the, the first set of questions uh, will regard legal submissions and briefs. Uh, I will address my, my first questions to Professor Marcelo and Maria Claudia. And Professor Marcelo, I will start with the first question to you. Uh, international firms, it's common to see lawyers who work only with arbitration. That is not the reality in most Brazilian firms, though, where lawyers usually do both litigation and arbitration. In your view, what are the advantages and disadvantages that lawyers who do litigation bring to the arbitration practice? Thank you, Leandro. Uh... First of all, I would like to thank very much the invitation to, to be and participate in this event. And I would like to, to, to send my compliments to the organization, to Monica, to 
and went to Georgetown University. And salute as well my peers in this uh, panel. And going immediately, immediately to your question, I would start uh, remembering that uh, Brazilian uh, experience with arbitration is, I would say, quite recent in comparison with other uh, countries and jurisdiction. And I would, in the first days, I would say 20, 25 years ago, the law firms tend, tended to use litigators, lawyers to work in arbitration. The, and the litigators at that time brought to, to arbitration, you know, the, the natural aggressiveness of judicial litigation. Arbitration procedures uh, tend to be, and it's my, my firm opinion, much more light, much, I would say, softer and more flexible than judicial litigation. But today, after almost 30 years or 25 years of uh, uh, ex Brazilian experience with arbitration, uh, I, I think that uh, lawyers working in arbitration uh, understood that the climate in arbitration is quite different and try to behave accordingly. Of course, exceptions occur, but it is to the arbitral tribunals, I understand it, and it's my opinion, to take the, 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 the opportunity to teach those uh, stubborn lawyers and try to adequate their behave to the arbitration culture. Uh, recently, uh, and I, I would like to mention the Brazilian experience, some law firms, I would say the bigger ones, are creating uh, arbitration sectors, arbitration areas with lawyers uh, working solely in arbitration. They, those lawyers, lawyers start working in arbitration from the, ve the very beginning of their careers and keep working only with arbitration. On one side, I think it's 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 a good uh, it's a good uh, tendency. Uh, lawyers familiar only with arbitration, uh, I would say they they tend to be from the very beginning of their practice uh, more and understand more the rules, the flexibility rules, the behavior rules of the arbitration, of a, an arbitration hearing, which is quite different from a judicial hearing. But, and this is something that I would like to stress on the other side, could be a, a in my opinion, of course, a problem. Uh, I think, as we say in Brazil, uh, the lawyer, and I think, this is my opinion, has to have some experience on leaning their bellies on the court's counters. I think the experience of a, a, a judicial court is very important. Uh, it's in, useful to, to organize a professional good experience to go to a judicial court to understand the strategy of the uh, judicial procedure and then adapt uh, this uh, experience to the arbitration cases. I would say efficiently adapt. I agree that arbitration has its own procedural rules. I agree, this is undeniable. But the procedural experience uh, before judicial courts Brings the law brings to the lawyer the exact sense of strategy and the sensibility to define when 
a pinch of aggressiveness is necessary. So I would say that to resume this my first statement and this uh, participation in this panel, that I see that in Brazil, some law firms are creating sectors uh, with uh, participation and work exclusively in arbitration cases. And I don't think this could be, I think this is good for the arbitration development, but I understand that, you know, a little bit of judicial court will have, will help a lot the construction of a good arbitration lawyer. This is my, my, my first response to your question, Leandro. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Maria Claudia, uh, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on the previous question as well. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. First of all, thank you and to the organizers for the invitation. I think Professor Marcelo and I are pretty much um, on the same page. I think that in terms of advantages, um, we should not forget that arbitration is a type of litigation. So any experience that a lawyer may get in litigating disputes and here I'm thinking of any opportunity to practice your advocacy skills or your written persuasion skills will be beneficial, will make you a better lawyer, will make you a better litigator. Um, also, you know, being familiar with the procedural laws and regulations of the seat of arbitration can be very useful for clients when it comes to advising on annulment proceedings or judicial measures in support of arbitration. So this can all be very helpful. With regards to uh, disadvantages, in theory, I don't really see any. Uh, working on both sectors, uh, you know, state court litigation and arbitration will, as I already mentioned, only make the lawyer a more experienced or will give him or her more tools that can then be adapted and used in any of these proceedings. So I don't think there is a disadvantage in being a lawyer that does both a state court litigation and arbitration. Now, and as Professor Marcel already mentioned, I think the issue arises when that lawyer transports to arbitration certain practices that are or should be exclusive to state court litigation. You know, the idea of arbitration, as you all know, is not to replicate uh, in a private setting, state court litigation, you know, in front of arbitrators. And some lawyers do have the tendency to do that. So I think that uh, it is, uh, that is when the benefits of arbitration get lost. You know, as Professor Marcel also mentioned, uh, arbitration is supposed to be a more flexible proceeding. So when we try to uh, uh, bring that hardness of, you know, state court litigation into arbitration is that is is when we probably lose the opportunity of having this more flexible proceeding. So I, I don't think it is in itself a disadvantage in practicing in both sectors. To the contrary, I think it is more dependent uh, dependent upon how certain individuals individuals behave when they act in arbitration. Thank you. Uh, Professor Marcelo, my second question is to you. Uh, in your opinion, what are the main differences between the reading submissions filed by Brazilian firms and the ones presented by firms from other countries, in special the common law countries? Do you consider that uh, the legal submissions drafted by Brazilian firms tend to be longer and less objective? Well, I think that it seems to me that prolixity uh, is not a privilege of Brazilian or even Latin lawyers. We have wordy lawyers everywhere. Uh, in general, uh, and I, it seems to me that uh, the more young lawyers, the more unexperienced lawyers, uh, they try to be more uh, wordy uh, when writing uh, 
legal submissions. Uh, when I have the, the opportunity to discuss with uh, my peers, my younger peers, I would say, a petition, let's say, to be submitted, or in a, an arbitration procedure, or even in a you know, state court procedure, I I try to to delete uh, and to clean the more I can uh, the, the 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 petition or the submission. Uh, I it I think it's undeniable that a good argument uh, repeated over and over does not get any better. Uh, I would say that if you say one thing, oh, this is a, and, and, and this is a tendency of, uh, I would say, please, I'm so sorry, and I, excuse me, young lawyers, but this, this is a tendency of young petitioners. If they find a good argument uh, to support their thesis or reasons, they repeat 10 times the good argument. The good argument doesn't go any better when it's repeated. I would say, on the contrary, it loses impact, and somehow, and sometimes it loses also credibility. Common lawyers, for example, uh, tend to be more longer and waste lots of time uh, with definitions. Uh, common lawyers love. To, to define and define uh, expressions, uh, articles, contracts. On the contrary, uh, the, the, I would say Brazilian lawyers are more uh, strict on definition concepts because uh, they rely more on the law, written law, or in the common sense. I, I remember, and it's... Uh, when the international contracts uh, came to Brazil 40 years ago, it was uh, I was uh, I was surprised what, with the definitions of the contract, for example, in written by common law common law lawyers. Let's say definition of the contract. The contract is this contract and no other paper that you have. Uh, over your table. The articles of this concert are the articles of this concert, and you cannot take any other article. So this kind of uh, constructing the, 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 the contract, I see sometimes in submissions, in arbitration, or I mean in proced judicial proced procedures in general. So uh, uh, this contractual experience, I think, uh, influences uh, the uh, common law lawyer. Uh, but to, to, to be objective, people express themselves according to their culture. Uh, if you take uh, Shakespeare, Dante, or even Camões, uh, they talk about the same human emotions. But they use different wording to express their emotions. The emotions are the same, but the cultural of each one of the writer uh, defines uh, the, 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 the way of the expression. So to, to say in a very single phrase, to answer in a very single phrase your question, Leandro, uh, I would say that lawyers are the same. Wherever you look for them, it's they try to be clear, they try to be convincing, they try to be objective. But uh, the art of, of uh, legal writing is to be objective, clear, understandable, but uh, without or avoiding to be tiresome or wearing. So I think uh, just to make a very quick answer to your question, I see some differences when 
Brazilian lawyers or Latin lawyers' rights vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, common law lawyers. Uh, but I think the harmonization is coming uh, when they live together and they work together. And our cultural inheritance is something that we cannot avoid. And we have to live, to live with uh, this inheritance in any event. So this is my, my reaction, my, my observations about your question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Maurice, getting a little bit out of the script, I'd like to hear your comments on the, the previous question as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Leandro. I endorse uh, uh, the previous comments about the my happiness and pleasure to be here today. I have a very quick comment on the first question, if I may, and um, I would uh, focus on the experience. I agree with uh, Marcelo and Maria Claudia that experience is key and it gives, may give, and normally it gives the flow of the art of advocacy, art of persuasion. It is a big mistake for lawyers, especially young lawyers who think that arbitration is glamorous, arbitration is charming, arbitration is appealing. So I'm going to dedicate only, solely on arbitration. I think the experience that you may have before local courts is an important one. The more you ride bikes, the better you ride motorbikes. The, the disadvantage I see, although I'm not in a complete agreement with Maria Claudia, I think the disadvantage or the risk is to bring a too much litigation mindset or even a too much uh, domestic mindset to international arbitration. This, even if the lawyer is a power machine, he or she needs some adjustment in order to work in international arbitration. On the second point, on the second point, I would add two uh, components. One is uh, sometimes the abuse, especially from Brazilian or civil law lawyers, the abuse of citation on scholarly opinion and the entire body of the case law. And not exactly the holding, but the entire body of the case law and citation of a scholarly opinion. If the, arbit the arbitration panel is a common law lawyer, scholarly opinion, okay, may help, but this is not they are used to see and hear. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and take into consideration. Finally, there is one thing that I can see from civil law and common law. Civil law lawyers use more passive voice. The car was bought by John. Common law lawyers use the active voice. John bought the car. It flows better for a common law lawyer mindset. That's my two cent comments, Leandro. Thank you, Mauricio. So the third and final question of this first part I'd like to make to Maria Claudia. Uh, based on your experience, do you consider that Brazilian lawyers tend to have a more belligerent approach than international lawyers uh, from other countries, especially the, the common law countries? And if so, what are the practical consequences you see in terms of the number of motions for clarification and judicial proceedings trying to set aside arbitral awards? Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. I, I honestly don't think that uh, Brazilian lawyers are more belligerent than other, you know, we call it international lawyers. It's, it's hard to find a definition or a group which is the international lawyer, but, you know, other uh, traditions can be very, or other um, legal traditions can be very um, aggressive and belligerent as well. Uh, I'm thinking of American lawyers, for example. They also tend to bring uh, this kind of aggressiveness sometimes to arbitration. And I honestly, I, I, as I said, I don't think that Brazilian lawyers are more belligerent. I don't think that throughout the proceedings they will create more incidents 
or they will you know, apply tactics that could be seen as more aggressive. I don't think so. I think that Brazilian lawyers are in general very good litigators. They can be very passionate um, and we can see that in our cases, but I would not go as far as to um, say that they are more belligerent. Now, in terms of motions for clarifications or requests for interpretation of awards, that we do see a lot more you know, being done, being presented in cases involving Brazilian lawyers or parties. Um, but I think this is more of a cultural issue. I think that uh, Brazilian lawyers, parties, they tend um, to, to see those requests for clarification as one less shot, uh, which is not the case. Uh, we all know that they have a very limited scope but um, they are still used as uh, a last resort. And this may be more so by Brazilian lawyers and parties than by parties and lawyers from other nationalities. Um, I would say that in a Brazilian case, or again, involving a Brazilian lawyer or party, it is very exceptional uh, for a request for clarification not to be submitted after an award. And in other parts of the world, they are um, certainly used less often, at least in my experience. In terms of uh, setting aside of arbitral awards, which is the second uh, example that you mentioned, I will not be able to say whether Brazilian lawyers try to set aside awards more than others. Uh, it's not the impression that I get. Um, I think that, you know, only an empirical study would be able to confirm or deny that. But, you know, from my experience, I don't see uh, annulments being attempted more in Brazilian cases um, compared to, you know, cases coming from other countries. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to, to ask my next question to José Gabriel. And I'd like to talk a little bit on the arbitration proceeding. So, José Gabriel, what are the key differences between domestic and international arbitration in terms of time frame, proceedings efficiency, and how the schedule is set by the arbitrators? Do you see any difference on, on that? I guess you are on mute. Sorry, this is one of the uh, most hurt uh, phrases in the recent times, you are on mute. <clears throat> I just I wanted to begin by thanking uh, 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 this uh, generous and, uh, and uh, very nice invitation to be here today with all of you. I would like to thank you also very much, the organizers and uh, especially Monica Murayama and Lucas Passos. And it is a pleasure uh, to be here and going uh, straight to the answer. Uh, I think that the arbitration proceedings tend to reflect the councils and arbitrators' legal background. For example, in an international arbitration, the general idea is that the arbitration should have a date to start and a date to end. And this date should be uh, set forth in the procedural calendar at the beginning of the arbitration. And so the calendar shows uh, the events that will happen during this arbitration, the date uh, uh, for each of these events, and that gives a certain predictability of when and how things are going to happen in the arbitration. In Brazil, in opposite, uh, the idea is a little bit different. Uh, uh, the, the idea is that the calendar covers the initial submissions of the parties, states that the production of further evidence, uh, expertise, exhibition of documents, hearings, etc., will follow a second calendar and a specific calendar that will be later constructed and decided by the arbitral tribunal. And this reflects uh, uh, easily the model of the Brazilian Civil Procedure Code. The idea, it seems that in Brazil, in domestic arbitrations, people tend to, um, councils tend to wish to have all the, to, all the doors open so that they can go 
into that door or that door, etc. Instead of having a, a, a calendar uh, uh, pre-organized and uh, previously defined, so I think that that's that's one of the the main differences, and uh, it contributes a little to uh, the comments that uh, one hears in Brazil that arbitration tend to take long time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, if you don't have a calendar that has already uh, uh, set the date for uh, handing down the, the, the awards, of course, it will tend to, to be less organized and less efficient. And uh, the second main difference is in the organization of the procedure. In international arbitration, there is usually a first round of memorials, claimant memorial and defendant counter memorial, where the parties must uh, uh, present not only the documents they have, uh, uh, but also witness statements, expert reports, etc., whatever evidence they have. And there is a second moment of the arbitration when there is the, the production of evidence in the hands of the other party or in the hands of a third party, followed by a second round of memorials, uh, uh, a second round of memorials where the parties will comment and will discuss this uh, uh, evidence that was uh, 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 put forward in this uh, in this sort of uh, discovery procedure. Then we have the hearing, then we have the, 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 the final memorials, and then we have the awards. So uh, this is a very efficient way of organizing the procedure because uh, at the beginning of the procedure, the parties must have already the evidence that they want to produce or they must have already identified the, the evidence that they want to produce. And uh, so it is, this is very much concentrated at the beginning of the, of, of, of the arbitration. And so uh, 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 it is much more efficient because the parties can also measure, let's say, their weapons in this dispute. In Brazil, it's quite different uh, because uh, you have uh, uh, a first round of memorials, then you have a second round of memorials, then the parties inform the arbitral tribunal about the evidence they wish to produce, then the arbitral tribunal rules on the production of such evidence, then the parties produce uh, uh, the, the evidence they, they according to the, to the decision of the arbitral tribunal, uh, in the event, of course, that there is no motion for clarification, as Maria Claudia mentioned a few moments ago. And then uh, uh, we will go to the hearing, and if there is an expertise, we will uh, start the expertise, and then there will be a hearing, and then there will be a, a, a final memorials, etc. And so it is much less efficient uh, in uh, uh, as, a, as a procedure, because uh, it seems that uh, we are shooting in every direction instead of concentrating in the uh, in the procedure. And then uh, there is, a, from my point of view, a, a, a third major difference is the, the extension of the delays. In international arbitration, my feeling is, um, my uh, experience is that the, the delays are shorter. That, uh, uh, May, uh, while in Brazil, major submissions can have 90 days or even like I've seen 120 days, etc. And this is, uh, in a certain way, I think catastrophic because uh, the issue is that, for example, in final memorials, if the parties have 90 days for final memorials, when the arbitral tribunal will rule on the case, the effects and the, and the impact of, of the hearing will be lost. So uh, the, I think that it's more efficient to have, as I've seen in international arbitration, shorter uh, time frames because it will also help to uh, uh, defend the case. I think this is uh, the key difference from my point of view. Thank you, Leandro. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mauricio, I'd like to, to hear your comments on legal privilege, which I believe is one of the hot topics in the difference between civil and common law systems. Uh, usually, common and civil law systems provide for a very different approach to legal professional privilege, as common law countries usually provide for a greater protection to privileged materials, such as the attorney-client documents. So. 
what do you consider are the key challenges that such difference brings to lawyers and arbitrators dealing with privileged claims in international arbitration, especially um, um, Brazilian lawyers and arbitrators? Uh, okay. Um, well, again, uh, thanks for inviting me, um, uh, Leandro, Lucas, and Monica. Um, your question uh, contains uh, uh, a statement in a question itself. The statement is there are differences. And the question is what the challenges are. So as an introduction, um, uh, first, we have to, uh, to consider what international arbitration is because your question lies on international arbitration. And there is a huge, well, there is differences, uh, statutory differences. For example, in Brazil, there is no definition of international arbitration, but rather the definition of a foreign arbitral award. So here I will take international arbitration as a very broad concept in a very broad spectrum. International arbitration commonly brings together parties, arbitrators, lawyers from different legal system, le uh, cultural background, and professional conduct backgrounds as well. International arbitration in that spectrum is truly a melting pot. Therefore, the largest or the biggest challenge for all involved in the international arbitration is first and foremost to really understand the characteristics of this environment. All parties involved, all players involved, arbitrators, parties, and of course, lawyers. For lawyers, international arbitration is not a litigation in another forum. You can be an outstanding lawyer before court system but you are not an efficient lawyer in arbitration because you disregard some of the characteristics of the international arbitration, this melting pot. It's not even, the domestic arbitration is not even, uh, uh, so the, the, the challenge goes also to the domestic arbitration practitioners. You do not, because you are an outstanding lawyer before a local or domestic arbitration, you don't have to assume that international arbitration is domestic arbitration where the arbitrate, arbitrator merely speaks a different language. So the seminal tip for lawyers is the following. You should be aware that your familiar rules, including professional conduct, rules may not be may not be applicable before an international arbitral tribunal now common law and civil law in general terms in both systems because the idea here is to compare and to navigate through the waters of common law and civil law in both systems communications conversation information exchanged between a lawyer and his or her client are protected and it must be so can you imagine we are all lawyers here can you imagine if we're not protected but protected from what from being disclosed or from being subject of testimony and now we have to also to understand the common law mindset the common law mindset brings the notion of discovery everything that is relevant, material, to the outcome of the case must be disclosed. So, and then you have this limited scenario the, uh, where there is an attorney-client or an exchange between an attorney-client. And there, where we can find the, uh, the notion of privilege. Uh, one step back, Still, discovery, and this is a, a broad comment here, uh, when, when we talk, when discuss about discovery, 
the common law lawyer knows already that everything that we can discuss about materiality, relevance, et cetera, et cetera, everything must be put on the table, regardless if it is harmful or beneficial to the client. And that's a huge difference between common law and civil law or US and Brazilian. Brazilian fundamental right of non-incrimination approach prevails and parties and lawyers have no obligation to full disclosure. So we have, this is the broad idea. Attorney client privilege, you know, Brazilian constitution stays there, article 133, also the Estatuto da Advocacia, the, uh, uh, the Brazilian Estatuto, the, the so-called rules of professional conduct, Brazilian professional conduct also has some provisions regarding this privilege. But the key challenges, the key challenges to lawyers and arbitrators are familiarity of one set of rules and take that familiarity to an international arbitration. Arbitral, arbitrators' challenges when dealing with that is how should the arbitrators proceed when there is an issue of attorney-client privilege? Now, which the substantive or procedural laws should govern the dispute of privilege. The arbitral tribunal has discretion to apply the set of rules, but the choice of rule may be different depending on the parties, depending on the arbitral tribunal's views, on whether the question of privilege is more on the procedural side, the common law perspective, or the substantive side, which is a civil law pr pr perspective. So the question then it may arise, may arise are the law of deceit, what the law of deceit says, the governing, the governing law of the contract, what the law of the place of document. But with modern technology, we don't know exactly if an email is Brazilian email or US email or French email. The law of jurisdiction where the lawyer is registered and the law most closely connect to the allegedly privileged communication or document. Lawyers' challenges. Can the client waive the privilege? Common law jurisdictions, yes, because privilege is a right that belongs to the party. Civil law approach, no, because the privilege, privilege is a professional secrecy and shall be kept as confidential by a lawyer, even if a client has waived. To finalize, Leandro, then in international arbitration comes into play, into play those soft laws. And then we have here the IBA or Prague rule, Prague rules, speci specifically IBA rules on taking of evidence, international arbitration, IBA rules on party representation. And then we can see a sort of um, an amalgam or at least an idea of bridging those two approaches. And According to Article 9.2 of IBA rules of on taking of evidence, the tribunal first has a discretion. The tribunal also can weigh the relevancy, the materiality of the evidence. And the tribunal can exclude from evidence documents, testimony, um, based on one of the following reasons. And then there is a list, and 9.2b means when there is a legal impediment or privilege under the legal or ethical rules determined by the arbitral tribunal. I finish with that. The laws, ethical rules determined by the arbitral tribunal. And the arbitral tribunal will take into consideration many things, but from the lawyer's perspective, hey, don't assume that your legal professional conduct, liability, ethical, etc., will prevail. You have to be open 
to some adjustments and some differences. Thank you. José Gabriel, Mauricio just mentioned and talked about document production and discovery. And I'd like to ask you uh, on this topic, especially because Brazil doesn't have a mandatory document disclosure or discovery in the same way as, as common law jurisdictions do, in, in for example, uh, the, the United States. Could you please share your thoughts on the on the on this issue, specifically on the challenges that such a difference bring to international arbitration? Thank you, Leandro. Uh, with pleasure. I just wanted to to uh, make a, a short compliment to Mauricio's answer. I'm always surprised to see the willingness uh, uh, and and the easiness as uh, Brazilian law to accept to the to, to take the stand and uh, the witness stand and, and, and make a, a, a witness statement on, the, the, on, a, on an arbitral tribunal. Uh, and that's very common when it is related with contracts and the negotiation of contracts and the interpretation of the clauses of the contracts. And uh, that, that always surprised me a lot that uh, uh, councils are willing to, to take the stand to discuss the work that they have done for the client and how they uh, uh, wrote a certain clause or a certain uh, point of the contract. But uh, coming back to the production of evidence uh, uh, of domestic and in, in international uh, arbitration, and to your question, Leandro, uh, from my point of view, the first main difference is that usually in international uh, arbitration, as I said, at the very beginning or even before the arbitration starts, the parties already hold almost of the evidence, uh, the documentary evidence at least, that they wish to produce and the witness, uh, they have already interviewed the witnesses, etc. And they have usually uh, reviewed all this evidence in depth and they have already defined the moment they will produce it. And the parties make a huge effort to be ready at the very beginning of the of, of the arbitration. In Brazil, the parties usually anticipate less the production of evidence. They tend to wait to see the grounds that the other party will raise in its memorials, and then they, the case is a little bit built as the arbitration unfolds and goes on. And so, uh, uh, from my perspective, the key points that Brazilian lawyers should uh, pay attention to when drafting uh, an arbitration clauses in terms of reference uh, is uh, to try to anticipate, 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 anticipate. Uh, while drafting uh, uh, an arbitration clauses, one should try to think what are the most probable causes for a conflict between the parties uh, where is the documentary evidence uh, uh, related to such conflict? Uh, is it in the hands of one client or in the hands of the other parties or in the hands of a third party? Uh, how much information does one client have? Uh, and how should this information uh, uh, and how much information the other party has uh, about this uh, uh, this situation that may uh, this possible conflict and then drafting the uh, arbitration clause accordingly and set a provision about the production of uh, uh, documents and about discovery and about any other uh, uh, issue that may be of concern or or that can happen in the future and uh, uh, the same thing happens uh, when drafting the terms of reference. And the terms of reference is easier because you have already the conflict materialized and you know already what are the main issues of such conflict. And so one needs to make a huge reflection and think about what I'm going to need to defend the point of view of my client. What is I'm going to... Uh, what kind of evidence I'm going to need. And if I understand or if I suspect that some part of this information or of some part of this evidence 
is in the hands of the other party, I must include in the terms of reference uh, uh, a provision, a specific provision for the production of such evidence. I think that the key word is anticipate, anticipate, and anticipate. And the beauty of arbitration exactly is that it is not mandatory to, uh, to, to follow uh, the background of the civil procedure that, uh, or the, of, the, of the procedure, uh, in short, of, of, of the councils. You can create the rules that uh, uh, will uh, apply to such arbitration and also, to, of course, to the production of evidence. So, once again, the key word is to anticipate. Thank you very much, Leandro. Thank you, Jose Gabriel. So uh, I'd like to move to the third part of uh, our questions and hear your thoughts a little bit on the he hearings in international arbitration. So uh, my next question is, is addressed to you, Professor Marcelo. Uh, in, civil, in civil law countries such as Brazil, judicial proceedings rely heavily on documentary material as opposed to oral testimony, which is quite different from what happens in common law countries. Do you think that this brings any difference on the way civil and common law lawyers prepare to a hearing and on their posture during uh, the hearings? Well, uh, from the beginning, I see no basic difference in the evaluation or in evaluating the weight of the evidence uh, when we take the, the practice of Brazilian or civil law lawyers and uh, lawyers coming from other legal systems. Uh, I understand that uh, this is a very, very personal approach each lawyer has. And this approach is different, varies uh, according to each case. Uh, evidence is a, a, a crucial issue in every procedure. Uh, and when you say, is there a difference between oral evidence, testimonies, or documentary evidence, uh, if you allow me, Leandro and dear colleagues, I would try to, to bring uh, a, an interesting case from many, many decades ago when I was a law student at the University of Sao Paulo. It was, I think, the 11th century, a long time ago. We had, at that time, uh, a class. Uh, I don't know if these, these... I don't think there's still the same class called legal medicine, medicina legal. It was a class uh, related to the analysis of the medical, of some medical situations involved with law, legal psychology, uh, mostly related to criminal law. At that time, in the 60s, we had a, a, a a professor in this uh, uh, class, his name was Professor Costinha, and he was, you know, he was a doctor teaching to law students, and he was a very, very uh, popular professor. His classroom was always full because he used to teach the, his, his, his lectures in a very, very interesting and uh, uh, curious way to, 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 uh, to the law students. And I remember one class, he was teaching the class. I can't remember the matter, the subject matter of the class. And then one of the students in the back of the classroom asks a question. An, an, an appropriate question, nothing to do with the, the subject matter of the class uh, which the professor was uh, teaching at the time. And he asks the question, when he finishes the question, 
Another student says, what a stupid question you're raising now. You're wasting our time with this subject that there's no, no link what we are talking about. You, you are an idiot. The guy, the student from the back, says, you're a stupid, you're an idiot. And he comes across the class to the other guy, and they start a fast fight, a fast fight. Fast, uh, fast uh, fighting between both of them. All the classes, uh, you know, you can imagine the the, the 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 terror of the class. Two two students, colleagues, you know, fighting uh, in front of us. Then Professor Costinha says, "Stop, please stop," and the two students immediately stop. And the professor says. Dear students, it was prepared. I was uh, rehearsed this situation with the, your two colleagues. Now you have to do the follow following task. Please try to write in one page what you did see in occurring in the class. What is your testimony about what you have just seen in the class? He took all the papers, and next class he comes with the papers, and he comments the papers. Dear all, there was no, there were no two uh, equal testimonies. All of them different. Each testimony went to a special issue. So one goes to the guy asking the question. The second one goes to the guy. Uh, uh, fighting the third one uh, and there was some uh, answers there some testimony is very curious uh, it's not a uh, sexism but most of them from girls saying uh, the testimony was uh, x asked the question y uh, responded and then they two came together so and i didn't i didn't see anything else because i closed my eyes so this is to, to, to show the, the relativeness of the evidence, and I mean the oral evidence. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that we in Latin American countries, or Brazil mostly, we use more documents than evidence. But as I always say, I do believe more in documents as well as I do believe more or less in oral evidence. I mean, when a witness comes to stand, uh, we have to trust that he's telling the truth. We have to, to, to understand that he, his memory is good enough to, to bring back the facts. So to answer your question, I see no differences. I think a good evidence has to be used, no matter oral or written. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you for the story you just told us. Uh, Mauricio, still on the same topic, do you see substantial differences in the way common law and civil law lawyers conduct examination and the cross-examination of witnesses and experts? Thank you, Alejandro. Um, uh, the short answer is yes, but uh, um, let me elaborate a little bit more. In, uh, I have a sense, and uh, some, do not, some people do not agree with me, but I can see today the following scenario in international arbitration. We can see, as far as I see that way, an internationalization of Anglo-Saxon arbitration to the same extent there is an Anglo-Saxonization of international arbitration or civil law arbitration. So today we see this meat of systems. Today we even say there is no such a thing anymore of common law and civil law, but experience and non-experience arbitrator and in lawyers. 
we can see, as we are discussing today, Georgetown students, how many students, how many Brazilian students are at Georgetown? They are going to take this, everything that they learn here in Georgetown, in Washington, in the US, to Brazil. How many foreign arbitrators are learning Portuguese or have learned Portuguese? How many lawyers, foreign lawyers, are learning Portuguese? This is something unthinkable 10 or 15 years ago. So we are now seeing those in importation or insights, inputs from experiences or principles from one system to another. Traditionally, traditionally, common law lawyers, yes, they put a lot of um, relevance or importance on the witness testimony. There is uh, even an anecdote saying that the, um, the sun does not rise until someone, until a witness says so. So that is the importance of the oral testimony before common law scenario. And there is a reason. So there is the crime of perjury, lie under oath, etc., etc. Some Now, let me go to some specifics. Under common law scenario, party representative is a witness. Unlike in civil law, like in Brazil, the CEO is not a witness or is traditionally considered not a witness. So his or her testimony is merely as, as we call, informante. Under common law, he or she is a very important witness who is going to be subject to cross-examination. So his or her testimony, oral testimony, is very important regardless the existence of documents. Preparation of witness. This is also, this is also important. The interview the lawyer has with the witness and the preparation, how to behave during the upcoming hearings. And this is something that common law and civil law has differences. Witnesses, this is a sort of a stereotype and I apologize for that, but normally civil law and Brazilians, we are very outspoken. When we ask, when we receive a question from someone, we tend to answer more than what was asked. And this gives ammunition from the opposing counsel during cross-examination. So the, a lawyer, a good lawyer tells the witness, you are going to, you're not going to lie, you can't lie, but you're going to ask exactly what the question was about. Don't make a speech, even if you know, because this you can give ammunition to the other party. Don't guess if you don't understand. Don't be careful, be careful, with what we call double negative question. I can go over this one uh, later on. Lawyers, be prepared for race objections because during the cross-examination, so lawyer try to, tries to discredit the witness. Do not exa exaggerate on objections. So see if you can use what has been or what was discussed during the terms of reference or if the arbitration rules do not contain terms of reference, the PO number one or the status conference, what has been agreed between the parties and the arbitrator for the hearing and you can make better use of the oral evidence. As far as posture is... Uh, just uh, uh, be gentle, respectful, uh, and be prepared for some aggressiveness of opposing counsel. Aggressiveness, there are tribunals who remain silent and give the opportunity for, the, for your counsel in redirect to correct, but there are tribunals who interrupt this situation and um, tell opposing counsel that this is not... Uh, litigation, but rather international arbitration, where the rules of the game may be different. Maria Claudia, uh, 
Mauricio just mentioned the way arbitral tribunals behave uh, sometimes in international arbitration hearings. And I'd like to ask you if you consider that arbitral tribunals with a civil law background tend to impose greater limits on cross-examination in terms of length of the examination, the scope of questions, and the way they try to control the council's efforts uh, regarding the witnesses. Thank you, Leandro. Um, I, I don't believe that civil law arbitrators tend to impose um, limits on cross-examinations or tend to impose more limits on cross-examination. I think that you know, experienced arbitrators are very aware of the rules of the game and how a cross-examination is to be performed. And I think uh, something that I wanted to mention, and it was already touched upon Mauricio, um, you know, as a general comment, we love to say that, you know, international arbitration is a mix of the civil and the common law tradition and so on, and we are truly international. Uh, but when we look at how the evidence is produced in international arbitration, it is very much a common law system. You know, it was uh, when we look at this uh, soft law guidances, guidelines, rules that are out there, we tend to see that, you know, the way the hearing is conducted is much more, um, much closer to the common law tradition than to the civil law tradition. You know, it was decided and I, it's probably a very good system. It's probably a system that it works. Maybe that's why we have uh, uh, adopted in international arbitration this system. But it is a common law uh, uh, system, a system uh, with which civil law lawyers are not necessarily used to. So uh, it is up to us, the lawyers, to learn how to play the game, even if it's not our tradition. Uh, if you want to be in that arena, and again, I'm talking about you know international arbitration. I'm not talking about um, you know merely um, adopting into a domestic context more international practices uh, that you know may or may not be convenient for every single case. But when we are talking specifically about international arbitration, I think we have to accept that what we are using is a more you know common law model. And we civil lawyers who want to, you know, act in this arena, we have to catch up, we have to train ourselves. And it is a technique with any other skill. You learn, you practice, you get good at. Um, I, I think that that uh, a mistake of some civil law lawyers, that is a mistake of some civil law lawyers, that they don't uh, spend enough time studying and practicing this technique. You know, I feel that sometimes direct examinations and cross examinations conducted uh, by lawyers that are not fully acquainted with the technique, if that technique is to, you know, expected to be applied in that given case, it's a lost opportunity. They're just not useful to the tribunal. If a lawyer puts a, a leading question in a direct examination, even if the other side does not object, I will not really take that answer into account because I know that the witness was led. So I think it's really important to understand the rules. And that's why, uh, for me, the most important thing, especially when we have parties from different legal cultures, is to make sure that the rules are clear at the outset. You know, you have to, you know, get to the hearing knowing uh, what the scope of the examinations will be, what questions will be considered objectionable, and so on and so forth. That's why the discussions between counsel and arbitrators and that pre-hearing procedural order is vital for the hearing to run smoothly. I think the worst thing that can happen is, you know, for us to get to a hearing, parties to be unsure of what you can or cannot ask uh, from the witness because they come from different traditions. They tend to do this exercise differently. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the rules need to be clear from the outset. I think if there's one takeaway that, that I would like people to get um, out of, <laughs> of this uh, this talk today is, you know, clear rules, but then if you are a civil lawyer and you want to do international arbitration, you know, we have to, we have to learn how to play the game. Thank you, Maria Claudia. Uh, Professor Marcelo, 
could you please share your thoughts on on this the, this topic of the hearings and the deposition of witnesses in international arbitration? Uh, yes, I, I would like to share with all of you. Uh, it's my personal experience and uh, my opinion about uh, examination and cross examination of witnesses and experts. Uh, when uh, this examination or cross-examination is conducted by a Brazilian lawyer or a Latin American lawyer and by an American lawyer, I wouldn't say a common law lawyer, an American lawyer, which uh, is the, the case from my experience comes and I would like to, to share with you. Uh, when an American lawyer, this is an average, this, of course, it's not uh, uh, the totality of them, but I would say it's an average. When an American lawyer goes to a deposition of a witness or even an expert, uh, it seems they're trying to lead an inquisition instead of an inquiry. The objective of the, the, this lawyer is only or mostly to discredit the witness or the expert and not to obtain the truth, to get the real facts. This is, of course, a, a, mind, a different mindset, but we are also discussing once again different cultures, different approaches to the same issue. Obviously, we have to defer, they have to defer. But uh, uh, this is the main difference I see. The, 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 the behavior of the lawyer uh, when starting uh, the examination or the cross examination. Most of all, I agree with all comments Maria Claudia and Mauricio uh, brought because they're they're very very uh, objective and they are effective and they are very useful to all of us uh, doing or interested in, in international arbitration. But just to, to finish and having these differences, these different cultures, these different mindsets, I would say, and this is, I say with, uh, you know, very happy to say that uh, I'm seeing that arbitration is uh, now more and more an efficient weapon uh, to the process of harmonization of procedural rules. Uh, I would say, as Jose Gabriel said before, that we have some common law practice adopted to the international arbitration, as well as we see some civil law practice practices getting together and creating uh, a, a, very, a very efficient uh, ground to conduct arbitration and to get to the i would say to the uh egg the exit the good solutions in arbitration cases i think this uh coexistence of uh, systems uh in arbitration uh instead of contrasting or bringing difficulties on the other side i see their helping to to construe to build uh, uh, a new posture a new uh, procedural system which is uh, efficient which is valid which is growing everywhere in the world today thank you leandro for for this little uh, uh, little comment thank you professor uh, I'd like to move to the final part of our discussion here and asking you on some practical tips 
for the members of the audience. And my first question for, for this fourth part is to you, Jose Gabriel. Uh, what would be your main advice regarding storytelling, cross-examination, the use of visual aids and techniques for reading the, the room that you could give to Brazilian lawyers participating in hearings in international arbitration disputes? Thank you, Leandro. Uh, I think that Brazilians are very creative and they usually excel in storytelling. You see uh, Brazilian soap uh, operas, uh, and the success they have, Brazilian television, Brazilian films, everything. And so they usually excel in storytelling, uh, cross-examination, the use of visual aids, etc. Brazilians are also uh, quite sensible to the room and to the reactions of the uh, of the arbitral tribunal and of the opposing uh, party and its counsel. So, uh, I'm, I'm, my uh, in international arbitration, the speech is normally more pasteurized and less emotional. Let's say. So my tip would be to start slowly, speak with emotion, and go step by step. Uh, use uh, little visual aids. Gradually increase the, the 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 tone or the emotion, and keep an eye on the arbitral tribunal, and to see how it reacts. If it is positive, then uh, uh, go for it and uh, increase uh, the the emotion. Uh, the other tip is try to be cheerful, uh, even if the case is complicated, even if your client is in a very bad situation, even if your client has suffered a lot, try to be cheerful, you know, and try to be happy. Uh, uh, if you are a litigation lawyer, a courtroom or an arbitration hearing room is your favorite place in the world. So. Uh, uh, be happy and try to convey some happiness in what you are doing and, 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 and cheerfulness because uh, uh, it will uh, uh, attract the, 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 the attention of the arbitral tribunal and people tend to, to, to hear more, to listen more to people who convey happiness than to those who seem to have a black cloud uh, over their head. So I think that's that would be the two tips. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Uh, Professor Marcelo, uh, international clients bring different, different cultural backgrounds. What are your tips uh, to young lawyers dealing with these international clients and foreign firms when they are working as co-counsel? I think that uh, the key issue is uh, to respect cultural differences. And uh, if you respect cultural differences and you try to understand your foreign clients, uh, you can bring them a good uh, work uh, and in general i i would say this is is the same uh, human beings are very very equal uh, they have some differences cultural differences uh, but in the core and you know the core of each human being is always the same and when you deal with foreign clients, uh, try to understand where they come from, what they want, and try to explain them the differences we have in our situation, in our culture, in, in our legal system, for example, and work. Uh, I, it, I always say that, uh, like a musician, a lawyer is 10% talent and 90% work, hard work. So if you don't have the 10% talent, if you only have 1% talent, but you do 90% work at the very end, you will do, you will produce 
uh, a good work. So no matter where the client comes from, try to understand his reasons. Try and go ahead, work a lot, study as much as you can, prepare yourself for an hearing, prepare yourself for a submission, and work, work. Uh, uh, there's no secret. There's no place for a lazy lawyer. A lazy lawyer will never be a good lawyer. So I think it's, it's very simple. If you are a good lawyer in your town, if you hard you work hard in your town as a lawyer, you 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 go, you will be a good lawyer in the world. This is this is my my conclusion after so many years of uh, legal experience. Thank you, professor. My final question is to Maria Claudia and Mauricio, uh, and uh, and please feel free to make any comments you wish on the on the previous topics as well. But I, I I would like to hear from you your advices for Brazilian lawyers lawyers that are already working or they are look looking for positions in international arbitration firms outside Brazil. So, Maria Claudia, if you if you want to start, thank you. Well, well, I I I must say, um, I I think I have to be honest and say that you know, with with the state of the world today, finding a position in an in, in international law firm um, is not that easy as it once was. I think maybe it was even Mauricio who mentioned, you know, you have. Nowadays, international arbitrators learning Portuguese and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't the case. I remember when I first arrived in Paris, there was a joke that if you spoke Spanish and walk past uh, one of the big law firms that handle all the cases against Argentina, they would hire you because that's what they needed. They had so much work and so few people uh, speaking Spanish at the time that that's all that matters. Uh, there was a time in which speaking Portuguese was a great advantage because suddenly all the international firms started showing this interest with the Brazil. They realized, you know, the, 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 the size of the Brazilian market and then they became very interested in people speaking Portuguese. I also, uh, you know, the, the biggest Brazilian cases are now being handled by the Brazilian firms. So you don't have that need anymore to, you know, go abroad so you can do international arbitration because that's that's all you can do. You know, you can only see international arbitration being made abroad. That's no longer the reality anymore. And with that, I do believe that in making a career abroad or, or finding a position abroad, um, it's probably a little bit more difficult today. I think the market is very competitive. So um, if I can give one advice, you have to find something that sets you apart. Of course, if you want to work abroad, obviously languages is a must. But nowadays, again, English is the bare minimum, um, minimum speaking Portuguese. You know, it's it's great, but it's no longer what will um, open the doors of international firms to you. So, you know, the more languages you can speak, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, they're all very sought after languages. Um, I think, you know, that's a good advice. I also think it's important to show an international inclination and, and open mindedness, you know, having a master's abroad or some work experience. For example, internships in international organizations. These are all things that you know help build your profile as uh, an international person. But I think the most important thing nowadays, and someone also mentioned this today, is that young lawyers shouldn't see arbitration as an end in itself. You know, arbitration is the process. You need to have knowledge in other things. You need to know the law. You need to know the sectors. So I think nowadays it's very valuable to have, you know, very good knowledge and expertise in construction, for example, in oil and gas or, you know, natural resources in general. This kind of substantive knowledge is very important. So, you know, I always get a little bit um, 
anxious about, you know, all these people going abroad to study arbitration and arbitration only. Uh, you know, I do think that you need the, the substantive issues and probably this is how you're going to, you know, set yourself apart from other candidates, trying to find an industry that you can uh, specialize in. Um, it's probably best because, again, arbitration is a process. And at this point, you know, you have very good people uh, doing arbitration everywhere. So uh, the last point that I want to mention, and, and in, I'm just going to repeat what Professor Marcelo said, I think people sometimes have the tendency to think that, you know, it's very glamorous to go to an international firm and arbitration is fun and nice and international when we travel. It's hard work <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, if you want an international career, this is something that you should plan for. You know, if you did your entire legal studies in your hometown, if you never cared for learning a, a different language, you cannot wake up when you're 35 and say, now I want an international career. It's not going to happen. You have to plan for it. You know, choose the right elective subjects uh, at a uh, law school. Uh, participate in this moot course. There are so many nowadays. Um, you know, again, show that you have this uh, international inclination, but you have to work hard. You know, if this is something that you want, you have to plan, and you have and you have to chase chase after that. It's not, you know, as some people might think that that just happens, or that some people are just lucky. It's a lot more hard work than luck. Uh, uh, well, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with uh, um, uh, Maria Claudia uh, and Marcelo. Uh, I see this question with two uh, approaches: those lawyers who already work in international firm, and lawyers who are aiming at working on those law firms. So two sets of lawyers. I understand that those lawyers are young lawyers already in the law firm. So my Tip of advice for those who already work in international law firm. Try to observe the differences, legal, cultural, and behavior. Try to learn with the good, the bad, and the ugly of what you will see um, uh, with your eyes. Learn with the more experienced colleagues in the law firm. Write, try to write on the subject, subject that you have experience. So procedural aspect and or substantive aspect of a given case, for example, or a topic that has been discussed in the arbitration. So show interest in going deeper on what you are witnessing. Share your knowledge about Brazilian practice with your colleagues in the international law firm. Brazil is an important player. You may be asked to help the transactional lawyer when he or she is drafting the arbitration clause, when there is a Brazilian party involved, and you may be asked to help the legal team if and when a conflict arises. Those who are looking for positions in international uh, law firms or in, that deals with international arbitration, first, learn just about everything you can learn um, about the law firm and its partners. If, if, there is, if there are cases, if there is anything that you can learn, you can observe before any interview, please do so. As Maria Claudia said, speak fluently, not only orally, but writingly, if I may say so, at least two languages, at least two languages. Being international or being part of the international arbitration community means being, mean, means being cosmopolitan. Uh, as also Maria, Maria Claudia has pointed out, it's important to build up your knowledge on an important sector of the law. Maria Claudia has just mentioned some of them, but try to be different so that you can be remembered. During the interviews, of course, don't show off. If you have 
ability to bring clients to the law firm, by all means, use that ability, but not do not overstate, do not overpromise. Uh, and perhaps, finally, and more importantly, be patient. The current generation is a very anxious generation because everything seems so easy. You can click on your computer, Google everything, you can get everything, you can get your cell phone, you have everything on, the, on your hands, but you do not have experience for international arbitration just clicking on your cell phone or in your computer. So be patient, be mindful to those comments that have been discussed and shared today. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. With this, I guess we are we are getting to the end of our event. I would like again to thank you, the four of you, for such a great and inspiring event. It is amazing to, to hear from you. Also, I would like to thank the Brazilian, uh, the George, Georgetown Brazilian Law Association uh, and the Arbitration Channel for making the making this event possible thank you again and i don't know if if you have any further comments but we are we are getting to the end thank you